Hey everybody and welcome back to Jim's Garage. Since my last video looking at deploying traffic, a lot of people have been talking about, well, what if I have more than one traffic instance? So it got me thinking about an older solution that I've covered, which is Docker Swarm. So in this video, as promised much earlier, we're gonna be setting up Docker Swarm with Ansible and it's automatically gonna deploy things like shared storage via NFS and also Portainer. And by the end of this video, you should be able to run that command you can see on screen, and all of it should automatically just pull down and configure your little Docker Swarm cluster. So in true Jim's Garage style, we're gonna dive through some of the configs and get this set up. Obviously, this is something that is extensible. So if you wanted to, on top of this, you could add things like PyHole or any other application that you wanted to, to make basically a pop-up home lab. So let's run through the configuration steps. I'm gonna reference some of my earlier Ansible videos for certain areas. I don't wanna tread old ground and I wanna keep this short and sharp. So as with my previous videos, I've got a setup for this. In Proxmox, I've actually got five virtual machines set up for the Docker host and one for the Ansible host. You don't have to do it like this with VM one and two, three and four and five down at the bottom. And the Ansible host, that one sits here. So this machine here, this Ansible, is able to connect to all of those virtual machines and run this Ansible playbook. You don't have to do it that way, but it's a little bit more production-y, whereby you would probably have your own dedicated Ansible instance that would connect to various servers within your infrastructure. So on the same machine that I've used in previous videos, you can see here I've got various playbooks. The one I'm going to be working through today is this one here, this Ansible Docker Swarm. Pretty obvious, right? And the first thing we really need to do to get a sense of what's actually going on is this here, the site.yaml. Now, this basically spells out what the playbook's going to do and in what order. So let's have a quick look through some of the logic. So first of all, it's gonna have set up Docker and NFS. It's gonna apply that to all hosts because basically all those five nodes, those VMs one to five, are all part of the swarm. Now that's gonna have two roles and roles are basically a collection of tasks and the more astute amongst you will have seen on the left hand side, there are folders for each of these roles. We'll go through those in a minute. But essentially what we're gonna do is install Docker. We're gonna mount an NFS storage. We're gonna apply that to some hosts. In this case, it's gonna be the first manager. We're then gonna run the initialization of the Docker swarm. We're then gonna say all of the rest of the managers, you now join the swarm. Then we're gonna say the rest of you are workers. You need to join the swarm as a worker. And then we're actually gonna deploy Portainer onto that. Now, as I've shown at the top, NFS, you will need an NFS share for this to work. I'm just using TrueNAS, but basically anything that can serve up NFS, this should do. In TrueNAS, I've simply created a test swarm NFS share in here, and I've just set this overly permissive, just anything can write. You'll obviously wanna dial that down if you're gonna be using this properly, but for testing purposes, this works fine. So with all of that set up, let's go through the playbook. So I'm gonna do this sequentially by following each of these roles and give a quick overview and also reference some older videos. So one last thing quickly before we go through the playbooks is actually to understand the inventory. And the inventory is basically the machines that are gonna join that swarm. So handily what we can do is click on the inventory folder and then we'll see this inventory here. And as you saw in that previous section, I had those managers. Those are basically manager one, two, and three. Those are VMs one, two, and three. And because this is HA, basically to be quorum, we need to have three managers. The other two are workers. Now it is really important to note as well that we can add some labels to these, for example, a bit like in Kubernetes. So for example, let's say this worker node and worker nodes are by default where your services will run. Let's take Plex for example. Let's say this host here doesn't have a GPU and let's say that this one does. We can actually add some labels to that node to say, hey, you've got a GPU. And then in future deployments, you can actually target that machine specifically so that Plex will only get deployed onto that machine. That'll allow you to do things like transcoding, etc. Other than that, really, we've got some all group variables. So these are variables that are shared between basically all of the machines. And so in here, for example, you can see the name of the user for my Ansible user, which is Ubuntu. I've covered all of this in previous videos, so please go and check out the series if you're brand new to Ansible. I've said, where is my NFS share? And that's basically what I set up within TrueNAS. And then for each service I would deploy on here, I would add another entry here. So I could have pihole variables underneath and I would have a share location for that, which is basically this mount point here. 
So create an NFS, mount it to each host, and then we're going to use that for the data repository. The reason I'm doing that is because things like LusterFS now in my previous video have been deprecated so you're probably living on borrowed time with that. In the collections folder you'll see some of the things that are required to make this work. I've covered that in a previous video but the important thing really is this roles. So let's click on the docker install and then we're going to go to the actual task itself which is this one here. So firstly it's going to go through and it's going to download all of the necessary dependables. Here you can see things like this. And if you go onto the Docker website, you can see where I've taken that basically. So it's then gonna add the key to make sure we can add the repository. It's then gonna install that repository. It's gonna configure some Docker daemon options. And those Docker daemon options, you can actually see in things like this variables file here. So for example, it's gonna use stable and an overlay to network. And you can see here that the storage driver here is set to that variable previously. Once we've installed Docker and applied those daemon options, we basically do a check to make sure that Docker is up and running. So we've installed it and then it's up and running. The next section really is to get on to mounting the NFS itself. So again, a similar set of folders. I've kept those consistent. Not all of them are populated. I've left them in because you might want to make some changes in the future, something specific to your setup. But effectively, if we have a look at the task, what this is going to do is basically make sure, first of all, that NFS is installed. It's not always installed by default. It's going to reload the system once we've installed it, just to make sure that it's active. And then it's going to check that the mount point that we've said, so where we want that NFS share to be, that actually exists. If it doesn't exist, it's going to go and create it. I think I can probably combine that in the future because when you create a folder, it automatically looks uh, for that, but I'll have to double check that. And then it's going to go ahead and mount that share. So that will happen to each of the nodes within the cluster. After it's done that, we've basically got Docker download to every machine and we've got the NFS up and running on each machine. So the next thing we want to do really is to initialize the Docker swarm. So that task again is pretty straightforward. It's going to say, hey, check if this is already initialized, i.e. have we already created a swarm on there. The reason I've put those checks in is because you can rerun this playbook if you want to add new services at the end. It's going to initialize the swarm using the Docker swarm in it, which you're used to using probably if you've been tinkering with Docker swarm before. Once we've got that up and running and we get a success, it's going to say get the swarm token for a manager. So you run this command here in the command line and that will give you a token. We're then saving that basically as a variable called manager token and then we're repeating the exact same process but swapping it out for worker and saving that as a worker token. We're going to need those tokens later on because when we connect to the different nodes we want to join it back to the swarm and that leads nicely on to the next step which once we've got that first one up and running that first node that's kind of called bootstrapping we want to go to the manager join and again, if we have a look at this task, we're now going to go through the remaining managers, i.e. managers one and two. Remember this three in an array and it begins with zero in that first array of three managers. So the first thing I'm going to do again is to check whether this machine is within the swarm. So we do that Docker info. It checks the swarm and makes sure that it's not already active. It retrieves that manager token from the fact that we set in the last step. And then it basically goes down and it does a docker swarm join and then it uses that token and it sets it to the IP address of that manager zero, that first one that we bootstrap. So it makes a connection to that first host using the token and then it can join the swarm. It will do that for both of them. So by the end of this step, you should have three managers joined. And then we get onto the next step, which is to join the workers. So if we go down here and have a look at the task, you'll see that again, it checks whether this worker is already in a swarm. If it's already in a swarm, it cannot join another one. It has to leave first and then rejoin. It then retrieves the worker token from that variable, that worker token. And then again, it will do a Docker swarm join. This one's in a different format, just in case you wanted it to be more readable. Or you can go back to the previous one where it's all sort of in one line. Once you've done that, you will have a swarm up and running. But I like to manage my things through Portana. So I've created here this workload for deploying Portana. Now, again, what we're going to be doing here is deploying Portana such that the data is persistent across all nodes in case of a node failure. So if one goes down, Portana should still be up and running. So to do that, I've made sure that Docker Compose is installed because that's how we're going to be deploying it, making sure that Docker started. We're creating a Portana directory for the Compose folder. 
We're then copying the compose folder and what you'll see here is if you go to templates, you'll actually see that stored as a .j2 file. That's a language that it understands for files that you want to load in as almost templates. And in here you can see just taken from the Portainer website, the Docker stack, it looks very similar to compose that you need to use. And in here, for example, you can see that placement that I was talking about earlier. So for instance, this is the agent. This should be installed on each of your Docker Swarm nodes. And what that does is communicate securely back to the portainer. This is the bit that you've probably been using before, that web interface. All of the agents, so all of the nodes, portainer will see them. And I'll demonstrate that in a moment. So once that's gone through and it's targeted the correct agents, it then creates some storage on that NFS and that's using that portainer directory we saw earlier. So it's just creating a folder basically on the NFS share and that's where it's gonna store that data. That's what gives it that kind of rudimentary persistence such if one node went down, it would spin up on another and because it's a network share across the whole cluster, each of them can access that data one at a time. Then we're gonna do the Docker stack deploy, which is very similar to the Docker compose file. Whew. Hopefully you're with me on that whistle stop tour. Like I said, please go and check out the entire Ansible series as I break each of these steps down much more slowly. So now that we've done that, hopefully we can head back into our browser now and we can log into Portainer. So let's take a look. So as you can see, 200.71, that's the IP address that we saw earlier. And now because it's the first time I'm logging in, let me just create a username and password. And hopefully then we will see our cluster up and running. I've hit the eye blinding uh, lockout. So let me just head into the terminal and restart that container so that we can get in. Now that's restarted, hopefully we can click back and start our new. And this time clicking it, yeah, we get straight in, great. Now, the thing you might notice straight away in a bit like a Kubernetes is you'll see that we're on 200.71. So let me try the next sequential IP address. So now if I hit 72, we should also now get the login. So if I now log in with that same user, you should see, yeah, we've got the same interface. So if I click on here and then click on my containers, you'll see all of the containers. Now, I have noticed sometimes when I do load this up for the first time, there are a few issues with the agent. And this is just using the official Docker stack, so I'm not quite sure. I think it's the race conditions about when it sets up the agents. It's complaining that port 8000 is already in use. But if you actually remove those failed containers, you'll automatically see that we already have an agent running on that VM1, which is the node I originally connected to. So I'll have a little bit more investigation to that, but broadly speaking, it's working. You can also see that it actually tried to spin up this one again, but by and large, everything is working as expected. And so now you've basically got Portainer and you can see that those containers just disappeared. And if I was to go on any of the IP addresses 71 to 75, we'd have the same experience. That's really good because although this is actually, you can see down here, this is actually now on VM2. So originally it was on that VM1. It's now moved over to VM2 when I did that restart. And that would mean that we can actually restart this one here. If I turn this machine off, it would find out that it's down because the replicas are set to one, it would spin up on one of the other manager nodes. But basically now you can go through and this behaves very much like you would expect with Portainer, just with that Docker stack in place. So you can actually use things like stacks to then go and add a stack. You can do that through the web UI, or you can add your own stacks through compose files and then via the command line. And so if you wanted to actually browse where this is all storing, you can see I've got that network location mounted to Windows, and then I've got that Portainer data, which is in here. And in there, you've basically got the standard files you would expect for Portainer. And that's why, because all of these nodes have access to these files, if one of the nodes goes down, it still should have access to the data. So thanks for watching, everybody. As I mentioned, please go and check out the Ansible playlist where I go through many of those steps in granular detail so that you've got the confidence to understand exactly what's happening and hopefully expand upon this playbook. But hopefully after running this, you've now got a swarm up and running and you've got the friendly portainer sitting over the top of it. And now you have everything you need to go and deploy your favorite apps. So maybe now you don't need those two traffics because you can replicate it across the swarm. Anyway, let me know in the comments below what you're gonna be using this for. Let me know if you're still using it and I'm really interested to know who's still using it in the enterprise space because I still think there's a good niche for Docker Swarm. You don't always need the complexity of Kubernetes. 
Anyway, as always, if you've liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody.